get those regulations more defined or open to any type of agricultural business potentially being allowed. Or not. Or not, well, but if there's enough steam behind it, I mean, if there's enough people that want it, remember, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Yeah. <laughs> it's free uh, for every uh, member of the Delaware Farm Bureau. I'm gonna have these on the table outside, so when you walk out, feel free to grab them. They'll be on the uh, the table with the blue, the blue carbon center. I, I guess it's a, a cloth material that I can't take out. But it'll, it'll be on the blue table outside. And and Tracy is a, is an is an excellent uh, tax expert, and uh, she'll probably agree that uh, that much of these uh, confusing and varied. Uh, different types of situations uh, would be what your individual estate plan uh, would have to take into consideration. And the land is your legacy. Um, they actually have a nice, like, if you if you go with it, like if you contact somebody and you, you know, it costs nothing to use their services, but you get provided with, this is kind of neat, you get provided with like a three ring binder and they literally are basically like the quarterback of the football team. They're coordinating with your accountant, your investment person, um, anybody who's involved in the farm management. Um, sometimes that might be um, your feed, your vet, you know what I mean? Anything that would go that we're trying to control expenses to make sure we can transition from one generation to the next. Their job is basically being the quarterback to do that, okay? So through that binder, each section works through every little piece that you need to do so when you get to the end of it, Hopefully, you've gotten all the information that you're ready now to go to your attorney, which your attorney's usually involved in that process too, but um, you know, you're ready to take it there and say, this is what we wanna do. And that process takes different lengths of time because it depends on all family dynamics. So it could take six months, it could take five years. I have a client that's been working on it for 10 years and we're still not through it. Um, it, it depends on each individual um, farm family situation. How many kids you have? Are they involved in farming? Are they not involved in farming? How involved are the, uh, is the next generation coming up? In some cases, it's the current generation doesn't want to do it, but the next generation coming up does. So there's a whole lot of things, and that Land is Your Legacy is a great program for that. Okay? Because they'll look at, and they'll look at everything. They'll look at, do you have the insurance policies there that if somebody passes away, once you transfer, how, is that, how are things going to get paid? How is it going to move? It's a very, very good program to get involved in, just as an FYI. So, okay, well, I'm sorry, I've been interjecting here. I'm Tracy Garfolo. Um, my firm's name is Top Notch Accounting. I'm based out of Dover, Delaware. Um, I have been an ag accountant for almost, well, over 20 years. Yes, yes. Um, and I've done tax work primarily in Delaware, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. So I've kind of hit the three states that are around um, and work through clients that are going through this, going through tax planning, whatever we need to do. Um, but this is especially important because I know there's a lot of questions that were floating around. Is this taxable? That's kind of what we're going to get into. And it depends on every person or every farm's individual situation is going to come into play into this. Okay. And it's not something you're going to walk away today with what Jimmy went over and what, what I went over, and your brain is going to be out to here, okay? The idea behind this is not necessarily to come back as an expert, but to get you thinking, do I want to do this? How do I do this? What are the things I need to look at to do this? So that you can start wrapping your head around how you want to do it, and then move forward, okay? It's not, you're not going to have an end-all, end-all question answered, just as an FYI. Um, so let's look at what is right for your farming operation, okay? Um, you pay the income tax generated from the sale, okay? One thing you have to look at, if you bought your, let's say you bought your property, you just bought it last year. You didn't buy it from a family member. You didn't get any discount on it. Um, you paid $4 million for your property, okay? You want to come in and you want to sell your easement rights now, okay? When you do that, because you paid $4 million, that's gonna get allocated out between land, buildings, and your main home, if, the main, if there's a main home on there, okay? Land never depreciates. 
So if the value of the land out of that 4 million, let's say it's a million dollars. If you are going to sell all the easement rights on that land that's valued at a million dollars, $500,000, you are correct. There's going to be zero tax, okay? Because you have a thousand or million dollars that has not been used. It hasn't been depreciated. It's a value that's sitting there. But what's going to happen is you are now going to reduce your basis in that, meaning that instead of that property, that land being worth a million dollars, it's now only worth 500,000 because you're using 500,000 of that to make sure that you're not paying any income tax. Okay. Um, so a lot of this depends on the amount of money that you're looking at getting. You know, are you putting on the smaller end? Are you putting the 10 acres in there or are you putting a thousand acres in there? This, do you pay the income tax generated from the sale is individual to each farmer. Some of it could depend on how, you know, let's say it is going to be a large dollar amount and there's new regulations that are coming in because one of the things that the IRS is looking, not the IRS, Congress and I are looking at doing is they want to increase capital gains rates, okay, which are at an all-time low. You're going to pay a cap of 15% right now, okay? What they are looking at proposing is 39.6%. That is a huge jump, okay? And they are correct in the fact that people that are making under $400,000 a year probably are not going to get hit by that. You sell a million dollars worth of easement rights, you just blew that 400000 right out of the water. Now you're subject to that higher dollar amount. Okay, so this is where it, it comes into play. Um, that has not, that kind of because of COVID got put on the back burner. Um, I look forward to, as we start moving towards the end of the year, once we get past the election, you know, midterm, we have midterm elections, right? Um, once we get through that, I think we're going to start to see them start to focus on this, on some th changes that they wanted to do on the tax code. Um, I don't think they want to upset the apple cart right now, in other words. Um, okay. Do you consider a 1031 like kind exchange? You also hear people call this a tax free exchange. And we're going to come up there's as we get into this, there's going to be um, a nice slide that kind of, sorry, I blew it up because as I'm getting older, trying to read it in that small little thing <laughs> gets a little bit hard, but it walks through all the process. You know, is this something that's right for you? Um, are you in your forms and you're selling your easement rights and you don't want to pay tax? Do you buy a replacement property? Do you buy more farm ground? Okay. Do you buy rental property? Do you buy some other type of income producing property? If you're in your 70s, my guess would be you kind of don't want to do that. Might not be your best scenario, but it depends on every individual farmer and farm family. So then you got to look at is there a charitable contribution that's generated? So we've talked a lot about discounting it. So in other words, what was the average discount? It was 44% 44. 44. in this last. Okay. So let's say your, your ease of rights, the appraisals are done and it comes down and it says it's worth a million dollars, but you're willing to give back 44%. That's what $440,000. So you're going to take 1 million less that 440, what's that? Five points. And sorry, I'm not creating that in my head. I mean, I know I'm an accountant, but one, one sometimes says no was equal to. So I always do use my calculator. So you have to you know, <laughs> um, so you're going to be accepting less than what's there. That's going to generate uh, a charitable contribution. Guess what? That can be really beneficial on your taxes. Okay. So depending on where your basis is at, depending on if you want to do the like kind exchange, how much of a charitable contribution is there, all of these things, there are all these moving parts that come into play. Okay. Um, so do you pay the income tax generated? We gotta look at how did you acquire the property? Grandma and grandpa bought it back in the 20s. Probably you don't want to do the pay the tax scenario, okay? Because land values back in the 20s, there might've only been $1,000 on that land. And now your easement rates are worth a million dollars, okay? That would be a scenario where you would look at it and say, maybe I should look at doing a tax free exchange. Okay, because your basis in that land is low. Remember, basis is what you bought that land for. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> now, if you didn't buy it, what if it was gifted to you? Okay, 
Gifting is a little bit different than inheriting, okay? If I'm alive and I choose to gift it to my kids while I am still living, my kids get the basis that I have in it. So if I bought it in 1920, living well before I was born, um, if I would have bought it back in 1920, my kids are now going to have the basis from 1920 because the basis follows the gift. And that gets really important as we talk about these, the charitable contribution part of it. Keep that in your mind. Basis follows the gift. Okay. Inherited. Well, okay. So I pass away. My will says I'm going to give it to the next generation coming up. Okay. Based on where our fair market values are of our properties right now. Oh, that is really good. Because guess what? The kids, if you paid $1,000 for that land back in 1920, you've now died and you've passed it on to your next generation. They're getting the farm market value on the date of your passing. So if that's valued at $4 million, guess what? You have a $4 million basis. Okay. That's a lot easier to absorb selling your easement rights. Okay. Um, and these are all the things, like I said, it's all these moving parts that we need to look at. If you purchased it, that very first scenario where it said, if you, if you recently bought it and you bought it at fair, true fair market value, that makes a difference too, okay? Did you buy it at fair market value, okay? You gotta remember there's something when you talk about at a discount. So this is how the IRS looks at it. The IRS says, okay, I'm selling to my kids. It's a related party. They see all related party transactions like you are trying to pass this or pass this down so as to not pay tax, okay? There's, those scenarios are scrutinized hard by the IRS because it is a related party. Believe me, I have seen related party transactions. There's no deal in there. You actually pay more than fair market value for the property because family dynamics, okay? Um, but that is something you have to look at because guess what? If mom and dad bought that property, let's say the land is valued because that's what we're working on selling this season, right? If that land is valued at $1,000, that's what they bought it for. Now it's worth a million dollars. And mom and dad say, yeah, we're gonna sell it to you guys. We really want $600,000, okay? That is a discount. That is below fair market value, which means you only have that thousand dollars in basis. Well, guess what? Not that that's going to go very far. Now, forty percent of that is going with that gift, okay? Because the basis follows the gift, okay? Um, that's where all of this and every farm situation is different. Um, I haven't worked through a single one where it's been identical every time. So for the, those of you young guys, you might not know that. So I used to be Uncle Sam down there. I couldn't get a really good um, description of Uncle Sam. <laughs> um, but do we want to pay it? Okay, so what tax is actually generated? Okay, so we talked about the different scenarios. Is it a fair market value? Is it a discount? Did you inherit it? Did you buy it? Okay. Well, you're going to have federal income tax. It is given capital gain treatment. And if you look... Your one handout, maybe I was just given that one. It might be one of these other, that nationwide handout right there. They talk about in there about it being capital gains, okay? Which everybody seems to be, I don't know why, seems to be really afraid of capital gains. Like I'll have clients look at me and say, oh, I really don't want to pay that capital gains. Well, let me tell you what, capital gains is going to be cheap right now. You want to pay capital gains, especially if you have something large like this. I have a, a client, he's a, a Christmas tree grower. So Christmas trees are treated very differently when you sell this because you, you have to plant them and seven years later is when you're going to harvest them. And when you harvest them, you have what they call stumpage. Well, guess what? Stumpage gets capital gain treatment. So even though they have this Christmas tree farm and they are buying in some trees and they've got this stumpage, their stumpage is usually greater larger dollar value of income than what is going out um, from their purchase stuff. That stumpage is subject to capital gain income. Client calls me every year and says, I swear to God, this form is wrong. Like, what form is wrong? They said, well, it's capital gains. 
like when I work through it, I should be paying a whole lot more in tax. I said, well, so much of your income is taxed to capital gains. You're now getting capital gains on everything. Okay. Don't be afraid of capital gains unless the IRS changes the tax code or Congress changes that. Okay. Um, because the current rate for land is 15%. Now, when they went through, let um, me think here, when Trump was in office and tried to simplify the tax code, well, really wasn't simplify it. Um, it did lower some tax brackets, um, but you're looking at most people are gonna fall probably in the 22 to 24% tax bracket. 15 is so much better, okay? So look at the big picture of things because most people are not going to fall in that zero to 12% tax bracket. Okay. So this capital gains rate is pretty good. Don't ever be afraid of capital gains. Okay. Yeah, right now, the proposed rate at the highest level is going to be 39.6%. All okay? right. Um, so there's a thing called farmer status. Okay. So I don't know how many of you guys work with ag accounts, but um, farmers have very different rules than the rest of the world who files their tax, or the rest of the U.S. citizens who file their taxes, okay? Um, if I'm a self-employed individual and I'm not a farmer, I am absolutely required by the IRS to make quarterly estimated payments, okay? Farmers can do that if they choose to, but what farmer has consistent income throughout the year that on April 15th, June 15th, September 15th, and then January 15th has the money to do that. Think about how when crops are harvested. Certain times of the year might be better than others, okay? Um, so this is where the rules come into play for farmers and fishermen, okay? Because the income is earned unevenly throughout the year, farmers have two unique options that nobody else has, farmers and fishermen. First one is, you don't pay any estimated taxes, but you file and pay your tax return by March 1st, okay? Now, what was it maybe five or six years ago when they changed the reporting requirements for um, investment houses? You know, it used to be by January 31st, they had your 1099 DIVs out. Um, then they went through and they changed all the reporting requirements. Well, now they have until February 15th. And if I, if they file an extension, they have until March 15th. Okay. If you file a tax return on March 1 and you don't have that included, you've now filed a fraudulent tax return. Okay. Because you didn't report all income that was necessary. So the other option that farmers have, that only farmers and fishermen have, is you pay 66 and two thirds of the expected tax by January 15th. And that gives you until April 15th to pay the remaining balance, okay? So yes, is that a larger amount to come up with? It is, but think about this. You're just coming off of harvest season. If you do a good, this is what I love tax projections. I'm gonna start those in about a week and a half. Um, when I start tax projections for clients, we're gonna look at how much income do you have from January 1 to the time we're doing the projection? And how much do you think you're gonna have between then and the end of the year? Okay, we're going to compile all of that together. We're going to look at what your income, what your expenses are, where do we think you're going to be? That is where we are going to calculate that 66 and two thirds tax that you're going to remit. Okay, um, so, and we look at, at least I do, I look at cash flow. Are you A, going to have the cash flow to do money coming in and on hand to cover the expenses you have going out, all your applicable prepays, which by the way, farmers are the only ones who get to do that too. So that's of that um, uh, tax code for farmers, you know, we, we get a little bit of flexibility in that. Um, and for the most part, 90% of my farmers are now doing a January 15th estimate with the remaining part being due on April 15th, just because of the delay of getting everything else in, okay? So to qualify as a farmer, 66 and two thirds of your gross income, gross income, must come from farming, okay? So farm normally grosses a million dollars, okay? Um, total income on the return is 1.2 million, okay? So there's 200,000 of other income. Well, 66 and two thirds of that, you're gonna have that in your farm income, in your gross farm income. Remember, they're going off gross, not your net. 
So the number that you're starting with before you deduct all your expenses. You throw in a $2 million easement sale, you're no longer a farmer. Because now your gross income is $3 million. And 66 and two-thirds of $3 million is now $2 million. And you only had a million dollars of farm income. So, so this is something, this is where you really need to work with your tax advisor so that you can make good financial decisions. Um, you know, let's say this fall, you get your, all your stuff in by October 31st. Um, they get through all your appraisals. And next year you want to do, um, you actually want to sell your easement rates. You're going to get that money in and it's going to knock you out of farmer status. Okay. First thing we need to do is set you up with estimated payments. So that you pay one on April 15th, June 15th, September 15th, and January 15th of the next year. Okay. Um, then you've met the requirements and there's no payments. This is huge because let's say in that first quarter of the year is when you get that easement money. So when the IRS and state start looking at this farmer status, if you're not in that anymore, and you had that easement sale in the first quarter of the year. Your penalties begin on April 15th based on the amount that you should have made. And the safe harbor is 100% of the prior year. Okay, so if 100% of the prior year was $10,000, we're going to have you pay $2,500 a quarter. You've now met the safe harbor rule. Doesn't matter that you may have $50,000 or $60,000 due on April 15th because you've met the 100% of the prior year. This is all these things that you need to look at. Okay, when you're looking at how do you how do you do this? How do you structure it so you keep the most amount of money in your pocket and don't give the government money before they need it? Okay. Um, um, oh, sorry, I already jumped onto that one. What does this mean as far as farmer status? Okay. So now we need to look at the state of Delaware. What tax is generated? Well, there is state income tax, but guess what? We're really lucky in the state of Delaware. It follows the federal rules, okay? So whatever you can pretty much do for the federal, you get to do for the state. If you lived in um, Pennsylvania or Maryland, that's not 100% true, especially the state of Pennsylvania. Um, you're gonna be paying a whole lot more tax in the state of Pennsylvania than you are necessarily here because they would not observe this charitable contribution that you may get, okay? Because they say, okay, you paid uh, $1,000 for it, you sold it for a million, we want tax on $999,000 times 3.07%. State of Delaware says, hey, you took charitable contributions, you itemized, you get to itemize for the state as well. And you get to further reduce what you're gonna owe, okay? So the current Delaware rates, um, they're a graduated scale anywhere between 2.2 and 5.5% up to $60,000. Once you hit 60, and you go 60,000 and one dollars, anything over that 60,000 mark, one up, is at 6.6 .6 of income, okay? Um, this is where your charitable contributions come, can play a huge difference because you're getting a $500,000 charitable contribution, 500,000 times 6.6%, okay? Um, so we want to look at and say, is a 1031 like kind of exchange rate for me? Okay, that depends. You know, we talked about the, the farmer who bought the farm back in the 20s and had $1,000 worth of basis. That would be an excellent person to do a 1031 like kind of exchange, okay? These like kind of exchanges are very good when you have a low basis and are selling at a high price, okay? Now, if you notice, my little guy down there in the corner, you see what he's doing? He's kicking the can, okay? What we are doing by doing this, we are kicking the can down the road, okay? You are going to save income tax on it now, but that may have implications in the future. Um, now, if you plan on passing this property down to the next generation when you die and you get a stepped up basis, yeah, do the tax for exchange, okay? is you're gonna get rid of all your basis you have in it. You're gonna get this new property. When you pass away, the new property is gonna get a stepped up value. Yeah, that's looking pretty good, okay? Um, so like kind, so the IRS went through and um, gave a little bit better clarification on this probably five or six years ago. Um, it used to be like, if you sold a piece of equipment, 
I shouldn't say so. Let's say you traded a piece of equipment. Traded a piece of equipment on something that was $100,000 and you got $40,000 in trade. $60,000 is what your basis was in that new property that you got to appreciate, okay? Well, when they came back and they defined this like-kind exchange, the only thing that really qualifies for that anymore is real property, which is like land, buildings, um, rental properties, okay? Um, and what that means is you buy a piece of equipment for $100,000 and you traded something in for $40,000, you still get to depreciate $100,000, but you've got to pay tax on whatever that gain is on that $40,000 piece that you never saw the cash for, but you traded it. It, it's treated as if it's sold, okay? So this is where this is really, really important when you come into um, farmland, buildings, um, rental properties, okay? You can defer your federal income tax until a future year, okay? There was a lot of rumblings when the well, when they were going on and doing the 2020 elections about tax code and changes that they want to do and blah, blah, blah. Well, COVID has kind of put all that stuff on hold. So right now, we really don't know if there's anything that's going to happen here. But what I can tell you is you have really good tax rates right now. Okay. Um, but like I said, if you are planning on passing over your property to the next generation when you pass away. This really, this part doesn't even matter. The deferring the federal income tax to a future year does not matter, okay? Now, one of the things that they are looking at doing is they are looking at changing um, the exemption amount. Right now, it's like 5.365 million per individual for inheritance tax purposes. So as long as your state is under that, you're not gonna pay anything in, in inheritance tax on the federal side. And you get that stepped up basis to the next generation. So what has been proposed during that 2020 time, which like I said, hasn't really seen the light of day since, that what they're looking at doing is, is they wanna drop that down to like a million or a million and a half. And then anything over that would be taxed. The inheritance tax rate would be that 39.6, okay? Um, I know because I was a longtime Farm Bureau employee, I can tell you right now, I'm sure all the Farm Bureaus are gonna to band together and try to get legislation if that does go through because the farm bureaus are right now are the reason that we have that great capital gain rate because they really went to bat and fought for that. And that's when I talked about, you know, starting at the grassroots, you know, you start at your local, it moves to the state, gets enough momentum, and state goes to the federal. When you start getting several hundred thousand or even million people saying they want this, you get a lot more steam to get somewhere. Okay. Um, so Kind of got to get a little active, go in, support this stuff so that farms can transfer to the next generation and not have to be sold. Okay. So, will the tax rates be higher? I'm thinking yes. As of right now, we don't know. Um, and if you're planning on selling, so, so, so I did have a client. They, okay, they had a, um, it wasn't, um, wasn't that they sold their easements. They had a rental property that they sold. They decided that um, they just wanted to buy another rental property. So guess what? This happened pre-pandemic. Um, they do the tax-free exchange. They sell their one property. They buy a condo in Ocean City. And then guess what? The pandemic hits. And it was really difficult because of the regulations and that stuff that were put on as far as cleaning protocols and all that kind of stuff it was really difficult. Now it is two or three years later and they said, we really don't want to use this as a rental property anymore. We're, not, we're, we're losing money. Just to give me an idea, I don't know about you guys, but how often have you had a broken toilet seat in your house? In one rental season, they had two broken toilet seats on the same toilet. Like, how do you do that? Put it this way, we don't want to know, okay? So the client comes to me and says, okay, do we have to continue to rent this property? Because it's just getting destroyed. And I said, oh, let's look about when you bought this, okay? They bought it and they held it for two years and used it as a rental property for two years. Now they're in year three. As long as you were on year three or later, that tax-free exchange 
is still considered valid. It still happened. You still deferred the tax. But if they would have chosen a year after they bought the property to do that, they would have to go back and amend all their returns and claim all of that as income. Okay, because you've got a holding period that you have to hold that new property for, and it has to generate income. Okay, um, so don't think you can do, you can't do, you can't sell your easement rights and then go out and buy a brand new house that you personally are going to live in, because that's not going to work. It has to be an income producing property. Okay. Um, so here's what you look at and say, is an like kind of exchange property right for me? Okay. You buy, you but you could buy a house and rent it out for uh to get the number of years and then move into it yourself correct correct i had a client look at doing that but but look at this client scenario that two toilet seats working point and that was just like that, that was just a little thing that happened throughout the time um but yeah if you i had a client they actually looked at they wanted to do that they wanted to build this elaborate house they wanted to put the geothermal heat system in it i mean it wanted they wanted this to be the retirement home and they wanted to do this as part of their tax rate exchange they would have had to rent that for two years, two full years before they moved in there. Do you think a tenant's going to take care of that nice brand new house the way that you will? Maybe, maybe not. And then once that home is your principal residence for the required uh, period of time, then you can sell it and uh, chalk that off against your lifetime uh, exclusion on Absolutely. capital gain on sale primary. Rent. Absolutely. And that I have not heard rumblings that they want to change that. I think that's going to stay there. Um, Okay, so it has to be income producing real property, so real estate, or income producing real property. Okay, farm for farm. You see my picture, farm for farm. It can be farmland for farmland, farmland for rental property, and it must be located in the United States. So you can't buy it in Italy, you can't buy it in Jamaica, you can't buy it in Mexico. It's got to be in the United States. Okay, this is my little thing. I'm going to go off of this because this gets a little uh, small in here. Okay, if you're going to do a 1031 exchange, <coughs> there are some very, very specific things and very specific deadlines that you must meet or you do not have a 1031 exchange, okay? Um, the very first thing is, is when you have this agreement drawn up, you know, when they said you, you sit down and talk to the attorney, you know, when you get that one-on-one -on -one time with the attorney, if you want to consider, even consider, doing a like-kind exchange, you must have that written into that agreement, okay? Um, if it is not written in there, you, there and you signed that agreement, there is no way to do a like-kind exchange. Now, if you put that in there and you decide later down the road you don't want to do a like-kind exchange, no problem. The problem becomes if you don't have it in the agreement and now you want to do it, okay? So that's your big first thing. If you're even thinking about considering that, put it in the agreement, okay? Um, so when they talk about, so this is like the seven rules to follow, okay? Your first one is like-kind property, okay? Remember we talked about farmland for farmland, okay? Um, it has to be uh, property being sold and the property being acquired must be similar or like-kind. Back when they allowed um, what we consider tax-free exchanges in the sale of equipment, not sale with trading equipment, um, it was even that specific that you couldn't sell a cow and buy a bull. It had to be cow for cow and bull for bull. Okay, so now it just further defined it. Okay, um, it has to be in this uh, investment or business property only. Okay, it can't be personal property. So just remember your principal residence, if you want to do that, you got to rent it out for a minimum of two years. Okay. Um, the replacement property should be of equal or greater value. So one of my own staff called me know, a couple of weeks ago and he said, I got to run a tax rate exchange question by you. He said, they had it written in the agreement. They identified properties as you're going to see when come down through here. But he says, yeah, the market being as hot as it is, they can only get one property. What they sold was the gross value was 3.2 million. And what they were able to acquire was 1.25. Okay, so what does this say? Replacement property should be of equal or greater value. It doesn't mean the tax free exchange didn't happen, but when we get into the next part where it says no boot, no taxes, okay, for an exchange to be completely tax free, the replacement property must 
not be of lesser value. So in other words, you sell it for three million, you better be buying something for more than three million in this, you know, in this tax free exchange. Because if you don't, if your replacement property is less, yes, part of it is going to be tax free and part of it is not. Okay, you're still going to pay some tax. Now, I have a client right now looking at doing this, and I said, you know, when you have to identify properties, the market being as hot as it is, and what they really wanted were um, like rental properties. I said, you, you better identify 100 properties, okay? Because the chances of those 100 properties, you being able to even settle on maybe 10 of them because of how hard the market is right now, um, is going to be very slim. Now, farmland is not moving as hot as that, okay? So if you're looking at doing farmland for farmland or farm for farm, that's a possibility, okay? Um, when you look at two, it must involve the same taxpayer. So I think you had a question talking about um, like if you have multiple entities and how you have stuff set up, okay? <laughs> this is where on the tax return, the person selling the property and the person acquiring the property must be exactly the same. Okay, so if if you have an LLC that owns your farmland, and that's what you're putting into farmland preservation, and you personally want to buy all these rental properties, that is not going to fly for IRS purposes. It has to be the LLC is the one who sold it, the LLC is the one that buys it. Okay, has to be the same individual. Here's where the more difficult thing. Um, this is where I find. Um, if clients are going to have a senior moment on something, there's going to be three things that it's going to happen on. First, they don't have a written in agreement. This next one that we're going to get to, which is the 45 day identification window. So, remember I said to the client, you better select about 100 properties. Okay. From the time you I, um, sign, is it sign it? Uh, property owner has 45 days to identify up to, well, and here they're saying three potential properties. On farmland, I've known it to be unlimited because you have to identify them. Um, and you have to do that within 45 days of closing on that property. Okay. So if you can't find a replacement property, it doesn't matter what you do, you, you, the tax rate exchange is not going to happen. But the bigger part is the replacement party or the replacement property. You have to settle on that within 180 days, which is roughly six months, okay? So it also can be something that you can settle on. So if you're looking at something that's in foreclosure, those things I have seen, depending on what bank is holding on to it or what stage it's in, I wouldn't identify properties like that because you're probably not going to make that 180 day. Um, and this is all coming from, if you go on to this, um, that where it says finance blog, that's Surma, T-I-L-B. If you go in there, that's where this chart is from, okay? Um, so, sorry, I should have filmed that. Like, I, okay, now, let's move on from there. Let's talk about this charitable contribution. So remember we talked about this, in other words, you would gift it back or you would discount it, okay? This is where the appraisal comes into play, okay? When you, when farmland preservation, when they, when they come in and do that appraisal, you've already heard them talk about, they're going to do the appraisal basically two ways. So they're going to do it as ag value and as non-ag value, which would be basically development. Okay. Price that, that your easement is worth is the difference between those. Okay. So if you choose to take something less than a hundred percent, so that you can get accepted in the program and you get funds um, now, okay? You have to look at another appraisal being done. And when this first, when this regulation first came about, I thought this was a bunch of hooey by the IRS or by the appraisers to get more money out of people, okay? Well, just so happens I have clients who are appraisers. And I went to them and I said, really? Do these people really need to do another appraisal? Because one's already been paid for when it was determining the easement value. And they came back and they said, yes. They said, much to their dismay, 
they have to look at things differently when they do that one for a charitable contribution. They have to look at um, what other properties or what other lakes. So let's say you're preserving this farm, but you own a farm here, you own a farm here. They have to look at what does that do to the value of these? Does it devalue them? You know, even if you're not preserving those, they, there's cer certain things they have to look at. And now you have to put a copy um, of at least the first page of the appraisal, okay? That, that appraisal that is gonna be done for tax purposes is gonna have the IRS language in there that you need in order for them to honor that, which is not going to be in the one that's done that determines the value. So your charitable contribution could be greater or lower based on the second appraiser because of other things that they have to take into consideration, okay? So the charitable contribution comes into play when you're electing to receive less than fair market value. Um, so, so let me tell you, I had a, I had a client, so um, it seems like Delaware's getting a little more aggressive um, about putting farms into farmland preservation, which is a great thing. That's probably why you saw that huge that bump, doubling the budget to $20 million, okay? Um, in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, let's use them as, a, uh, as an example. Um, there, you probably would only have to discount 10%. Most, I've not seen anybody do more than 10%, and they've been accepted in there as long as they rank high enough, okay? So depending on how many acres you have, 10% in a charitable gift may seem like a lot of money, but until you pay for the appraisal and you pay to get these 8283s, which is this non-cash charitable contribution, okay? Those forms have to be signed. Um, the accountant prepares them, sends them off to the appraiser, for the appraiser to sign off that the values and everything that are on there are correct. Then it goes, comes back to the accountant, the accountant then sends it out to whoever did the gift, if it's from the state or if it's from the county or from this local. So there may be more than one 83, depending on who, where the funding came from. That has to be signed off on before that's an actual charitable contribution. When you look at the cost of that, if you're not doing a large discount, you have to weigh out, is the tax benefit that you're going to get after you pay for these things going to be worth it? Well, I can tell you, when you're doing more like 30 and 40% gifts, 99.999% of the time, it is going to be worth your while to do this. But your accountant can run those numbers and let you know, okay? Um, and that's where it has to be... Um, <clears throat> You have to make sure that the, the benefit outweighs the expense, okay? Um, so I will tell you this too. So this is unique to Pennsylvania. Some people sit there and say, well, why would I want to take less than for market value? Um, so I had, a, I had a client, they, they were in their late 80s. They had no gener next generation, they had no children, so they had no next generation coming up that wanted to farm. And they wanted to ensure that the farm stayed in farmland as it had been for the last several hundred years, okay? So in Pennsylvania, there's two different, there's Ag Land Pennsylvania, or there's Ag Land Preservation, and then there's the Ag Land Trust. Ag Land Preservation goes on a ranking system, and they look at things, remember they talked about like soil quality, road frontage, okay? You have to rank high enough to get accepted into that program. That's where it's a little bit different down here, okay? Those things are getting numbered. You just got to get above that, what, 170, okay? Well, here, that score would determine where you are at on this, okay? This client, they had the most perfect score for road French because it's almost all road French, okay? But soil quality, because they were in their 80s and they weren't actively farming it, um, it had been in a CRP program, uh, so the quality wasn't great, so they didn't score well on that. There were a couple other things they didn't score well on. Well, guess what? They couldn't get into that program, okay? Because they didn't score, they didn't score high enough to even be considered, okay? So that's the one where they got lots of money and a small charitable contribution. <laughs> then they had this farmland preservation that you could do at Glen Trust, where you took a huge charitable contribution and only accepted maybe 20% in cash, okay? But you got an 80% charitable contribution. Well, let me tell you, because of farm sales and that that they had um, in the past, 
um, and how they invested their money, they had a huge tax bill every year. So for them, this charitable contribution was huge. And it also accomplished their goal of putting it into farmland preservation to ensure that coming down the line, it was going to stay that way beyond them, okay? Because um, I had somebody ask, um, we did this in the spring. Somebody asked me that. Why would you, why would you ever, be, you know, why would you ever, you know, do that much? Well, it depends on each person's situation. Um, and you have to look at all of the items, you know, individually and then collectively together, okay? Um, so, and by the way, when I say a certified, when I say an unrelated, okay? If you ever go through an IRS audit, they're going to go through every equipment sale that you bought and they're going to come back and they're going to ask you five or six different ways. <clears throat> Did you know anybody at the dealership? Do you have any relatives that work at the dealership? Okay. Because they're looking for, remember we talked about that related party transaction. They figure everybody's getting a good deal out of that. Okay. It has to be an unrelated. So if, if you got a son or a daughter or a grandson, somebody who is a certified appraiser, not having to do this one. Okay, it has to be non-related. And this is where this form 8283 must be signed by the appraiser and the organization receiving the gift, and it must accompany the tax return. So guess what, in the year that you do this, um, you're not gonna be able to e-file your tax return um, because they want live signatures on this, okay? Um, and by the way, keep this because we get into this charitable contribution, depending on how large charitable contribution is, it may, you might get benefit out of it in more than one year, okay? So who does the charitable contribution benefit? Well, it's two parties. It can be you on your personal tax return or your business if that's who owns um, the property, um, or, or and, I should say and, whoever is giving you that charitable contribution, okay? Because they're getting it because you're agreeing to keep this as farmland, okay? So you've got two people who benefit. Um, the other thing is, too, because there is only, well, there's $20 million available, okay, it enables the organization, because the larger the gifts, it allows them to extend more offers to preserve more farmland, okay? Um, I, I will tell you, so it's really interesting in Chester County, Pennsylvania. So down here in Delaware, we're kind of lucky, because we, we have a federal tax, we have a state tax, okay? Pennsylvania has, there's federal, there's state, and then there's a local tax. Well, in Chester County, Pennsylvania, probably about, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago, they got really aggressive and they wanted to preserve as much farmland as they could. So there were a lot of, uh, a lot of townships that didn't levy any tax at all. They were like one of the only counties in Pennsylvania that, that had certain townships that didn't do that. Well, then they, they started doing that with the purpose of putting funds aside to do this so that they could be more aggressive and buy more farm ground. Okay, um, so the fact that it usually, um, I what I have found is when budgets are usually done, ag usually gets cut, ag budget usually gets cut. So to see it get increased, I think that's huge, and I think that says a lot. Um, and I think if you're on the fence, now's the time to think about it. Okay, um, so the donor that would be you as a farmer is going to pay less in income tax. Okay. So charitable contributions can reduce your taxable income, okay? Um, if the gift is substantial enough, any unused portion can be carried forward to a future year. I had it in my head that it was five years. And I was trying to search on the IRS website today just to make sure I had my ducks in a row. Um, according to what's in here with Nationwide, it said that it's on a code that was written in it's 06. It says 15 years. I knew it was either five or 15. Um, most people, I don't see it getting used in 15. I see it getting used in five. Um, okay, hang on. So I'm going to come back to this. Okay, so remember we talked about, you know, the charitable contribution. And is, it, is it worth it? Okay, so when Trump did the tax code and tried to simplify it, he did something where he doubled the standard deduction. Okay, so now instead of a married couple having a $12,000 standard deduction, it's now 24,000, okay? So now things that go into being able to itemize um, would be things like property taxes, mortgage interest, okay? Well, if you have a farm property, 
and you have a mortgage on the farm property, there's probably very little of that mortgage interest that's going to the house. It's all going to the land, you know what I mean? It's going on your schedule F and getting deducted towards um, the farmland and the buildings because that most likely when you look at the, um, uh, oh, county assessors, mailing assessors, that's where the majority of the value is going. And you can, you can calculate it out to that, okay? So, it, it has gotten harder and harder to um, be able to itemize, okay? So this is where if you are a, especially if you're a married couple and you are over 65, now you get to get above $26,000, okay? Um, and then it's only the amount over and above that that is gonna give you benefit. And this is where you've got to weigh out with your tax accountant, is this gonna be a good deal for us? You know, if if your itemized deductions are only at, I don't know, two or three thousand dollars, you know, whenever you give in charitable gifts, because there's really nothing in property taxes and there's nothing in no mortgage interest, um, you have to look at it and say, because the first twenty thousand dollars or so, you're not going to get any benefit from because you're already getting it because your standard deduction is higher. Okay. Um, the other thing that's nice is this will qualify you. So it used to be a whole lot easier. I used to be able to say, now your tax return, your main tax return used to be like two pages. I could sit there and say, and I could say to you, okay, look at that number on the bottom of the front page. That used to be your AGI. Now you gotta look, it's like line four or whatever. Um, let's say that number is $100,000. You would only be able to take 50% of that number in charitable contributions. And this is where this, this carryover happens. Well, if you've got a $200,000 gift and that number on the front of your tax, well, in that AGI number is $100,000, you're gonna cap at 50,000. So this is where you're getting your charitable contribution carryover, okay? So if you're <clears throat> in that scenario where you only have maybe a couple thousand dollars, if you've got a $100,000 charitable contribution, and you're only going to get maybe a two thousand dollar benefit out of it every year because that's what how much you're getting up over the standard deduction. That's where you need to weigh this out and determine is it best for you to do this. Um, and you can always accept less money. You just may not do that. Go the charitable contribution route, okay? And that's where you need to just make some educated decisions and determine how much you know. Is it going to save you five hundred dollars in tax to spend a thousand dollars to get an appraisal done? Or is it going to save you five thousand in tax, and you're only paying a thousand bucks for an appraiser? You know, because guess what? That charitable contribution will carry forward. It's not like you have to have it reappraised every year. It's only that one time you want that tax return. And make sure that there's eighty two, eighty threes that you have that you and your accountant keep copies of that. Um, and I would not necessarily file that. Like some of my clients file when the twenty twenty two year is done. Everything that pertains to 2022 is going in that box, okay? This would be one thing that I would carry from year to year because we have seen audits where, um, let's say the, the easement sale happened in 2017 and you have this huge charitable contribution carryover and you're now, they're now auditing 2022, okay? Even though they, can, they normally only go back three years, if something on that return started prior to that, they have the right to be able to go back and look at that particular transaction all the way through to the end. Okay. Um, so like if you have something that's getting depreciated, um, let's say um, you put up a new poultry house and it got depreciated over 15 years and you're in year 10 of that. They have the right to go back those 10 years to make sure that was when it was initially placed in service, it was done right. So when I say that, you want to make sure that you, you keep that where it's readily available and you don't want to go in with that tax file because IRS says you should keep everything for 10 years. Um, you know, let's say you do use the full 15 years. Um, that means that would have been tossed. And in an audit, they would toss it if they don't have the original document because for some reason in the IRS system, they literally cannot look at... Um, if they're auditing 2022, the auditor literally can't look at 2021 unless they open up an audit on that year. So it's really, it's, the way their whole system works is a little bit, um, I, I think it's for our protection, which is probably a good thing because I don't want them just going really going through stuff. Um, but it does make it a little more cumbersome. And that's why they want the original, you know, 
documents. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, okay, so now I'll go to my, my last part where it says questions, because I'm sure we're going to have lots here. Um, and it put it to you this way, I'm one where doesn't matter how silly you think or not pertinent, if you think it's not pertinent, ask it, because chances are if you have that question, somebody else does too. Okay, we'll just knock them all out to you. The amount, the dollar amount on the 8283, that still transfers to your Schedule A itemized deductions? Correct. Is, is it still your, your charitable contribution still have to be reduced by seven and a half percent of your adjusted gross income? Okay, that's just for medical. That's just for the medical. That's for medical. So you know when they talk about you can get this huge- So then the point is that on your, so, so how many, in your uh, uh, professional practice, how frequently is it that self-employed uh, farmers are itemizing deductions? Uh, Probably 50-50. And I, the reason I say 50-50 is if I have clients that have the means to do it, where let's say they're going to give a charitable contribution and they do it to the church once a year, but it's a humdinger of one, okay? Five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. So instead of doing it throughout the year, they want to write just one check, okay? What I'll have them do is just let the church know they're still going to give it, but they'll double up in one year. So one year you'll get, so it's kind of like, I don't want to say we play the game, but, and that is totally allowed within the IRS guidelines, but you know. What standard deduction now? So the standard deduction varies, but for married couples filing jointly, it's like 24, six. So your itemized deductions have to be more than your standard deduction. Degree. Correct, correct. And then, so something else that we have to look at too, is um, because the, the state's standard deduction is so much lower than the federal since the Fed increased it, we also have to look at it and say, and, and any client who lives who lives in a state where they allow itemized deductions, I literally run the tax return two ways. I run it where we take itemized deductions on both and we do standard deduction on both. You can't do standard on one and itemized on the other. What I have found because the state um, standard deduction is so small, that if all of a sudden you're you're teetering close to that 24 on the federal, you may pay a little bit more in federal income tax, but you save a ton in state income tax. That's why I run it both ways for my clients because I want to look at it and say, and then I go back to the client and I say, okay, you're going to pay a hundred dollars more to the IRS, but you're getting three thousand dollars. You're paying three thousand dollars less to the state. Which way do you want to go? I ask where you want to go. I, I never want to have somebody pay more income tax than what they need to, and I try to look at the total combined income tax. Um, but you are correct. It's, it's getting increasingly more difficult to, um, to itemize. And hey, my last question in this round, would you, uh, would you agree or disagree that the past practice of having to discount uh, in Delaware in order to be accepted in the program has benefited uh, higher income taxpayers than lower, than more moderate income taxpayers? Okay, so you're saying... The, if you give, if you do a gift or discount it, if you are a higher income, then In you're going to benefit higher from tax bracket. It. Higher tax bracket. Well, yeah, they're going to get more more benefit from it. But every person is different. In 2021, we had farm incomes that were fantastic. This year, I'm not so sure how that's going to go. Um, I have some clients who, who, depending on the area that they're in, because you got to remember, I cover three states. So there's a part in Maryland where they didn't get any rain. And they're worried that the farmers are worried that they're not even going to be able to meet their contracts of what they have to deliver. And then there's other farmers in the same county, but three miles away, they got all the rain they needed. Um, and they're going to have um, record bushels greater. Okay. So some of that is going to play into what is going to be more, you know, is it going to be more beneficial? Too. It's going to depend on their income level on that. Did that answer that? Not really. <laughs> well, I, so I guess I, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be a politician. I'm not trying to be vague. But, it, but, it, but, but would you agree that if we can work towards uh, 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 reducing the average discount rate for our Delaware preservation program? Meaning the farmer gives less back. The landowner has to give less back in order to be accepted. Okay. Then that's going to be more equitable 
to folks that get across all income strata. I would agree with that. And I would think having $20 million to work with versus $10 million. Like, I don't know how quickly those funds, so Jimmy, when they open that, when they open that program up, mm -hmm. how quickly have you, like, have you ever had to turn anybody down because you've gotten way more income or, or potential monies going out for the ease of rights than what are funds available? Like, if you ever run into that scenario, we've had to turn down and just say, we just don't have the money this year because we've accepted. Well, yeah, uh, I, I would say up until four years ago, we were turning down dozens of farms. Okay. Every year. So and that was it was so bad that folks that had been trying for year after year after year after year after year after year, after year mm -hmm. just finally gave up. Okay. Okay. And is it because we there's more money that's being allocated? Is it because people are discounting it more, or is it a, you know? Because I, I just think say that people are discounting less. There's more money available. There's more money available. Okay. And it to me it seems like this twenty million dollars. What do you think the chances are of that getting for 2024's budget being the exact same dollar amount? Wow, that's a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, just because it I is a huge. I don't want to touch that. <laughs> well, and see, and see, well, see, and that's the thing, and that's why I asked the question earlier. You know, if if you don't use it, so now you're getting double the money this year. If you don't use it, like if enough farmers don't come forward and say we want to do this, are they going to? You know, let's say they only use fifteen million out of the twenty. Does that mean that the next year the maximum they're going to get is fifteen million? That's why I was asking that question because I, you yeah. know, I don't know. But it and seems we've never, we've never really been in that situation. Okay. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly. What so we might be, we might be heading into unprecedented waters because this is double the amount. I would go out on a limb and say it will be much easier to get another twenty million appropriated in the next fiscal year's budget okay. if we're able to use up all funding appropriated for this fiscal year. Uh, I and I I would agree I would with agree that. With that yeah. yeah, I would agree with that. Because everything that I have known, I, one of my best friends, she's in government when she does her budget, you know, if she doesn't spend every penny of that in her budget, the next year her budget's reduced by however much she can spend. So I know it I know it sounds silly because I'm like, why are you doing that? She said, because I know I'm gonna have more more of this that I have to deal with next year. If I don't spend the money this year, I'm not getting it next year. That's and and I'll go out on another political limb by saying that that this is a much better program because it's it's for the purchase of easements mm -hmm. rather than for the acquisition of land by a government entity. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Um, and I think I think that this doubling this this budget that's there for that or doubling the amount is showing that the state of Delaware is dedicated and wants to preserve farm ground, which, you know, we saw in COVID how supply chain disruptions, everything happened. It seemed like because of those supply chain disruptions, it sent people, the general public, out to the farmers to buy, which was a great thing because that helped our farmers. And people need to understand they need to buy local because if you don't buy local and, there's, and that's not there, once the local farm is gone, Ain't getting back. When have you ever done them to tear down a parking lot and put in farm ground? You know, did you? Yes. So, at least I perceive you to be saying that the current capital gains rate of 50% seems to be to be an incentive to switch right while we're on top right. because of this proposed capital gain. Correct. There wouldn't be any sort of locking in that rate. Once the payment was made, you signed up for the program. Okay, so, so you're also dealing with the federal, you're dealing with Congress. Okay, so I've seen Congress in January, let's say in January of 2023. I've seen them in, in January of the next year make a regulation that affects the whole prior year. They've made it retroactive to there. Whether they will do this or not, I don't know. Um, I, you know, I've seen it. I've we've seen crazy stuff like that happen. So, correct. So, 
Possibly, possibly. But I would say work with your, your local politicians or your local political organizations to help um, look at it like we're trying to preserve the family farm and have them go at it from that avenue so that they can potentially block that put some kinks in the chain, okay? Because that's how we ended up getting the good capital gains rates that we have right now. Um, so, but, but you're right. Um, and they could make it retroactive. They could not, I would think if they make something like that retroactive, I'm, I'm really hoping, you know, when they're looking at, um, somebody asked me, okay, so what happens if I die on, you know, 10 days from now? And the current regulations are, I get to pass 5.3 million. Um, we, we've had about, years. we've had about, I just figured it up in my head, yeah. roughly around 35 years now of a tax policy, of a federal income tax policy that has given more incentive for folks to make long-term investments. Uh, you, we've had these, the, you know, in one way or another, a specialized treatment of capital gains mm -hmm. uh, so that the capital gains are taxed at less less amount than ordinary income which has uh, which is which has uh, resulted in what uh you know those economists want and that's for folks to make long-term investments rather than than short-term thinking mm -hmm. so you know that's something that's on our side uh, every time that we uh, that we have uh, and I'll, I'm, I'm not fearful of saying political things. Every time that we have social democrats uh, trying to uh, to employ uh, practices that cause folks with higher uh, incomes to have to pay a larger portion, uh, you know that's what we fight back. Is that economically, it's good to have long term investment. It's good to have a policy that favors long term. And I would hope that it would adversely affect the politicians who are in Congress to make said changes. It is what I would hope. Just like for years they've been talking about the self-employment income from, or, or I shouldn't say that, from an S corporation, the profit that flows out is not subject to the self-employment. They've talked about probably for the last 20 years making that subject to that. I wholeheartedly believe that hasn't happened because it would adversely affect the people who are making the laws. And the only thing we can hope is that that is the exact same thing here. Any other questions? Yes. Why, I was curious to know why your uh, phone number, the Pennsylvania number has been doled. So I only moved to Delaware five years ago. Um, when my client base shifted and it was bad enough changing my address for all of my clients, I kept the phone number exactly the same. So that way, because I've had this number for 20 years now and I kept it the same for that purpose, but you are correct. And sorry, you'll notice right now because I bought a car in Maryland and I do have Maryland tags on my car, temp tags until my Delaware ones come in, but it is a dollar. <laughs> sorry, you had basis. Uh, yes. If you if you bought the bought a farm in 1980, $2,000 an acre, just say, mm -hmm. uh, and you uh, sell it today, is that $2,000 indexed to today's dollars? No. It is not. No. And you got to remember, too. So a lot of times we when we value farm, like um, when a farm goes on the auction block, they'll sit there and say the farm brought $25,000 an acre. Okay. That's because they're taking the purchase price, dividing it by the number of acres that are there. Monies have to be allocated to personal home and to the buildings. Okay, so just because back then it was two thousand an acre, that whole two thousand might not have went to the land, and that's where we need to look at um, the entire. Per I've had clients where I've had to go back thirty years and have them pull the records from when they bought the farm because it had never been allocated. Like we couldn't figure out how it was allocated out. Did they have a basis in it? What were we doing? Um, where we've I've had to go back and reconstruct it, it is not indexed at all, even if it's just dirt for dirt. There are no structures on it. Nope, it would be nice if they did, but they lose an awful lot of tax money that way. Well, the government, the OMB indexes their own dollars, their own programs. And if you look at the OMB analysis of, of programs going back 
80 years. Mm -hmm. They 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 uh, they compare they compare everything in constant dollars. Right. I I mean I think that would be a nightmare for the appraisers. Um, I think there would be a whole lot more of regulations because, gosh, I can't tell you. I mean, sometimes it's really hard to pull records from 30 years ago. And I would assume you would have to have, it's not, it would not be good enough in my eyes for the IRS to say, we're taking what's on your depreciation schedule. Because I could have put that asset on there today with a value from 30, you know what I mean, from 30 years ago and said, well, this is what it was. As long as we're all paying the same rules. Well, correct, <laughs> correct. So I always like, so when I have to establish something like that, I want something to back it up. So that way, if my client ever goes through an audit, I'm able to say, this is the paperwork we use. This is how we came up with it. And that, for me, stays part of my client's permanent records because, you know, like I said, if it's audited 10 years down the line, we're still depreciating farm buildings. They have a right to look at that transaction. I want to make sure I have everything that shows how I justified everything that I got. Doesn't mean they're not going to challenge it. But it at least shows that I've done my due diligence. And a lot of times the IRS auditors are very happy that somebody has actually done that. Anybody else? So is everybody's head spinning right now? Okay, so just remember, your brain's out here now. It's like this big sponge. You're going to go and you're going to digest stuff. Okay? Um, it's not meant to come out here and have a decision today. At least that's how I look at it. All right, so if there's no more questions, thank you everybody for having me. If y'all have any questions, you've got my number on there. All right, thank you. Have a good night.